Good morning and Happy New Year. Why don't you guys stand with us? Welcome to church this morning and thanks for joining us, joining us online. Thank you for being here. This morning we will be taking communion in a little bit. Uh, so gather those elements if you haven't already. And so as we start this new year, let's thank God for what he's done. Thank him for what he is doing and what he will do. Psalm 136, verse 16 says, To him who led his people through the wilderness, his love endures forever. We have a Savior who has navigated the wilderness perfectly before we ever had to. He is one we can absolutely trust and rely on. Amen? We are we're going to face wilderness seasons. We're going to be singing about that this morning. We're going to be facing desert seasons. But maybe you're in a season of growth or abundance, but whatever season you find yourself in, let's just draw near to him this morning and let's praise his holy name. Let's sing.
turn to the people around you and bump elbows with them and say hello.
Heavenly Father, we just thank you for your goodness. Your love endures forever. As we come to the communion table this morning, Father, we remember your sacrifice. Lord, whether we're going through that dark valley or we're on the mountaintop, we bring you praise in every season, Father. We thank you for the sacrifice of your son, Jesus, on the cross. We, we love you. In your name we pray, amen. You can have a seat. Well, good morning, everyone. Well, this morning, as uh, we enter into communion, I want to tell you uh, a quick story. So a friend of mine who's a church planter, um, he had uh, a new person come to his uh, church plant, uh, and that morning they were having communion. And so later that week, he, he asked uh, my friend, he asked him, so I, I'm curious, uh, when are we going to have shots and appies again? So, you know, maybe you're here this morning and you don't know what this whole shots and appies thing is about. Or maybe you've been here for a long time, but communion has become ritual. And you might not re really remember, or maybe even you never fully understood what this whole thing is about. And so this morning, uh, before we entered into communion, I just want to share what communion would have meant to the original believers who came from a Jewish background, because communion is actually rooted in the Passover celebration. It's actually rooted in the Passover celebration. We don't often talk about that, but it is. It's rooted in the Passover celebration. And Jesus instituted this right when he was eating the final Passover meal with his disciples before he went to the cross and died on the cross. And actually, interestingly enough, there would have been the bread would have been called the bread of affliction, and one of the three was actually broken in half. And so when he talks about this is my body, which is broken, it's very symbolic. And the cups, there was actually would have been four cups of wine, right? So if you like wine, you would have enjoyed that, right? Four cups of wine, and each one of them meant something. So the first cup was actually the cup of sanctification, okay? And this is something they were doing to celebrate that they had been set free from slavery in Egypt. The cup of sanctification. And they would say to one another, um, representing God, I will bring you out and set you apart. And as followers of Jesus, he calls us out to be set apart, to be people that live lives that exemplify love of God and love of other people. So Jesus calls us to do the same. We are a sanctified people. We are a set-apart people as followers of Jesus. The second cup is the cup of deliverance. They would have had this cup. And this means, I will rescue you. So for the Hebrew people who had been brought out of slavery, it represented uh, being set free from that. But for us, it represents being set free from the slavery of our sin, the guilt and shame that goes along with that, but also giving us freedom to live differently to not stay stuck in our sin. So that's what the second cup. And the third cup, which is the cup he would have actually taken to institute communion, means I, it's the cup of redemption. And they would have said to one another, and I just think that this is so cool, the line that they said to one another, uh, God says to them in this cup, I will redeem you with outstretched hands. And I think of Jesus going to the cross and how he redeems us with outstretched hands. Just incredible, the symbolism of how Jesus takes what was a Passover and says, this is now symbolic of me and the new covenant. And then there was actually a fourth cup, which Jesus doesn't drink. If you read in Luke 22, he says, uh, I won't eat, drink of this fruit again until uh, its fulfillment um, in the new heaven and the new earth, the new creation. Because the last cup, um, it symbolized the imminent arrival of the final exodus of the Messiah. And one day, this also reminds us that one day, we will get to be part of that final exodus where we get to go and be with Jesus in the new creation. Just so beautiful, the symbolism of communion. And so this morning, we want to remind ourselves 
that Jesus has done all these things for us and look forward to his return as we celebrate eating and drinking the Lord's Supper together. If you don't have one, just raise your hand and uh, we'll make sure you get one. But now let's, let's open the bottom. You know, some, or it's the bottom for some of you. If you're gluten-free, some of you it's not. But open up the bread and let's just pray for it and then let's take it together. Jesus, thank you so much for your sacrifice that you are willing to be broken for us, that you are willing to die on our behalf. And thank you for this bread which symbolizes that act for us. In Jesus' name. Let's take the bread together. And now let's take the cup and let's remember all the things that this cup is symbolizes. Jesus, thank you that you were willing to set us apart, to rescue us, to redeem us, and that you are creating a place where we can be with you forever. We drink this cup in celebration of that. In Jesus' name. Please stand with us. We're going to respond in song.
life eternal. I believe in the virgin birth. I believe in the saints' communion and in your holy church. I believe in the resurrection when Jesus comes again. For I believe in the name of Jesus. I believe in God our Father. I believe in Christ the Son. I believe in the Holy Spirit. Thank you, worship team, for leading us, and um, thank you for joining us both online and in person. And um, we've just been singing about uh, about the things that we believe. We're declaring uh, that which we believe is core to our our faith um, in Jesus Christ. And so, uh, if you're here this morning and this is all brand new to you, um, I hope that you are getting a sense of. Uh, who we are as a church family and what we, what we believe and what we think is really, really important. And so I'm glad that you've uh, joined us this morning. Um, you'll notice, uh, if you've been around here a little longer, uh, that my voice is a little bit deeper, and it's not because I'm going through puberty or anything like that, uh, but it is because uh, I have a cold. So if I stay a little distant from you this morning, that's the reason. I'm not interested in spreading it all around, and so I will, I will keep my distance and try not to spit on the front rows here. So um, we look forward to... Uh, uh, to looking at God's Word this morning. Um, I want to thank our congregation in just a really, really big way uh, on behalf of our, um, our men's ministry uh, group. Um, our congregation has engaged with um, the Women's uh, Wonder Winter Fest, a ministry that is going to be happening here just in a couple of weeks' time, uh, a ministry to our women neighbors in downtown Prince George. Um, you folks have just uh, done an amazing thing. It's, um, we we want to remind you of a couple of things as we kind of approach that day. Um, you have engaged in incredible ways with the Backpacks of Love and just wanted to remind you that uh, by next Sunday, we're inviting you to have those backpacks. If you haven't turned them in already, to, to turn them in with uh, that which you've uh, loaded them up with. Um, and, uh, and there's still five ornaments on the tree representing five backpacks that still could be taken. And so if, uh, if you're here and you'd like to uh, take one of those ornaments today, please um, do that. Um, uh, Del Reinheimer or Phil uh, Pudlis will, will be at the tree this morning. And we're looking forward to how God is going to um, use this ministry to, uh, to love on our uh, women neighbors in downtown Prince George. Second, uh, related to that, is we need to be intentional in prayer. Nothing is going to happen unless, unless we actually uh, see the Lord work through prayer. And so thank you for those who have been praying. We invite you to continue to pray. And this coming Thursday, there is a prayer walk happening. Uh, a couple of them have happened already. And there's going to be another one uh, happening this coming Thursday from 1210 to 12. 50, um, at the downtown uh, corner of 7th and Dominion. It used to be the old swimming pool. And so if you want to um, join in that, uh, that would be something that would be really, really um, encouraging to those who uh, come and to see God at work. And so let's just take a moment now and uh, seek the Lord in this regard because we need him to, to work in and through this ministry. Father, we thank you so much for... Um, uh, your love for us, and as we've uh, reminded ourselves of that as eating the bread and, and drinking the juice, representing all that you did for us on the cross, 
all that you um, are doing even now and what you will yet do when you come again. Uh, Lord Jesus, we say thank you and we pray that that same love that you gave to us would be lived in and through us in very lavish and generous ways. Would you go uh, before us as we uh, prepare this uh, ministry event for uh, those uh, who are uh, living in our downtown core? We pray that they would receive um, these acts of love, this, this relational um, time together uh, with, uh, in the way that we intend to, to give it. Um, and so, Lord, would you go before us and prepare every step of the way. Uh, we trust you. Uh, we believe that you will do great things, and um, we depend on you for, for everything. Lord, as we turn to your word and we are encouraged by it, we pray that you would open our hearts and our minds to see what you have for us. For we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, we had, uh, this last week has been a week of all kinds of readjusting and, and, and uh, changes in light of uh, some of the things that we had planned for. We had uh, planned to have a number of people sharing their testimonies of faith to be received as members uh, at Westwood in this service. Uh, things have been adjusted a little bit. Uh, life happens, and so uh, we've had to alter uh, some things. Hopefully, we can hear those testimonies in the not-too-distant future. In the second service today, we are going to be um, uh, witnessing the baptism of three individuals, uh, one young adult, uh, Brody Beetlestone, and then a, a married couple, Randy and Brittany Brophy, uh, are going to be sharing their testimonies and following Jesus through baptism, and that's exciting. Um, it's been a delight to see how God has been at work in and through their lives, each of their lives in various ways. And, uh, and so in the second service, we have the opportunity to do that. If you wanted to stay around, you certainly would be welcome to do that um, because I know it's an encouragement to many. Um, it's also fitting as we think about um, declare, uh, declaring our faith and for these folks sharing their, their testimonies as they follow Jesus in baptism, it's also fitting as we start a new teaching series in the Gospel of Matthew. Um, we're going to be in the Gospel of Matthew for the next number of months, and, um, and today we're kind of jumping in in Matthew chapter 3, where we actually witness um, Jesus' baptism and the baptism of, of actually many others of the day. And so uh, it's fitting that uh, we have the opportunity to hear some of these, these testimonies today. And when we start in Matthew's gospel, uh, Matthew's gospel is really all about Jesus. It's about his life, his ministry, and how he invites all people to surrender their lives uh, fully to him. And how many, when we think about that word surrender, how many of us really, really like that word surrender? <laughs> right? Like usually it has a negative connotation to it. We don't like to surrender our lives to anything or to anyone. Um, it's not easy. The journey of surrender is a challenging one. Uh, and today, even as we hear the testimonies of Brody and Randy and Brittany, uh, they are taking one more step in their journey of surrender to Jesus, which is what we all really need to be doing, taking that next step of surrender. So as we study uh, the Gospel of Matthew, and we begin in chapter 3, which is where we're going to start, um, it's all about surrendering. It's all about following Jesus Christ. Now, why are we starting in chapter 3? Well, we just celebrated Christmas, the Advent season, and the first two chapters of the Gospel of Matthew are all about the birth of of Jesus Christ, which is what we've been celebrating. Uh, Jesus Christ coming into our world to bring us salvation for our sins, uh, which is why we can celebrate communion the way we did today. But then all of a sudden the scene shifts when we turn to Matthew chapter 3, and we fast forward about 30 years or so, and there's these two men that come together, these two men who were actually babies together just 30 years previous. John the Baptist and Jesus. And John the Baptist and Jesus, if you recall, were actually kind of second cousins, right? John the Baptist was the child of Zechariah and Elizabeth, this old couple who, who thought that they couldn't have a child, and then 
uh, God fulfilled his promise to them. And so now in Matthew chapter 3, these, these two men who were once babies reunite, which is a really, really important part of the entire biblical narrative because it actually links the prophecies of a Messiah to come who is going to be preceded by a voice preparing the way, this prophecy of centuries, centuries before, it links that with the birth of John the Baptist and Jesus. And now here we are, these two men, about 30 years old. John is the voice, the signal, the trumpet saying, this is the one whom you have been waiting for. This is the one that you've been longing for. This is the one whom the prophets prophesied years ago. This is the one that you were hoping for salvation to come. Here, here he is. Listen to him. Obey him. Follow him. So in Matthew chapter 3, if you have your Bibles, I would invite you to turn there, and we're going to look at uh, the entire chapter a few uh, sections at a time. Here's the setting, beginning in verse 1. In those days... John the Baptist came, preaching in the wilderness of Judea, and saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. This is he who was spoken of through the prophet Isaiah, a voice of one calling in the wilderness, Prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. John's clothes were, were made of camel's hair, and he had a leather belt around his waist. His food was locusts and wild honey. People went out to him from Jerusalem and all Judea and the whole region of the Jordan. Confessing their sins, they were baptized by him in the Jordan River. This, this text actually has become a lot more colorful to me since uh, about a year and a half ago, Leanne and I uh, were on a study tour in Israel and we were, we were right in the Judean desert. We were by the Jordan River possibly where, um, where this um, event happened. And, and we, when we went to these different parts of the Judean desert near the Dead Sea, both those words, dead and desert, adequately describe the landscape. Um, it is barren, it is hot, it is uncomfortable. There's not a lot of life there. Um, like literally not many people live there. It's not, it's not where any church planter would go to plant a church. And yet that is where John the Baptist goes. He actually goes into the wilderness to proclaim a very, very simple message of repentance. And against all odds, there's folks who are actually coming to hear the message. They're coming from the big city of Jerusalem, they're coming from Judea, they're coming from the area of Jordan, and they're responding to a man who is wearing very simple and nomadic clothing, camel hide, which would have been really, really practical for him, and he's eating basic food that's provided by the land, locusts. And they probably shouldn't think of, you know, like kind of live locusts or anything like that. They probably were dried and probably crumbled up and in a paste or something like that with some wild honey. Like really, really simple and kind of, you know, out there. Like John is the guy that probably most of us would steer clear from if we were to see him in our town. Right? He's, he's that kind of guy. We're, we're not running uh, to, this, to this individual. And yet he's proclaiming this message that would also invite mocking and laughter and disgust in our day. Yet in the middle of nowhere, in the desert, in the desert wilderness, people are responding to this message of repentance. Now what exactly is repentance? Um, repentance is not merely spoken words of apology or confession. That, that might be part of it. But true repentance is a turning. It's a, it's a turning from and a turning toward. It's a, it's a reorientation of one's life. And in the biblical sense, it's a reorientation of one's life on Jesus. It's a thorough inner change. Something that happens within you that's evidenced by the life that is lived on the external. Um, 
It's a life that becomes, over time, directed by Jesus. Not by personal desires, not by popular opinion, not by cultural norms, but by Jesus and, and his values. And that's hard, because it's surrendering of everything that we are. It's a surrendering of, of who we are, it's a sur- or who we think we are. It's a surrendering of what we do. It's a surrendering of our time, our gifts, our interests, our money, our hopes, our dreams. And we take all of that and we surrender it to another, to another being Jesus. And we trust in faith that he knows what's best for me. Now for some, maybe many in this crowd, and it seems like there was a fairly large crowd, um, these folks who came to John, they knew about the prophecy that this Messiah would come to bring salvation, and they were waiting. And maybe they just needed a little bit of prompting. Like, oh right, we remember that there was this prophecy of old that God was going to send a Messiah into our world to bring about salvation. And now, uh, that, that prophecy is unfolding and it's coming true before our eyes. Like for some of them, maybe many of them, maybe it was a bit of familiar language and, and they just needed a little bit of prompting. In our day, I would guess that we have to back it up a whole lot more because for most, there, there's, there's just really not any kind of understanding as to why we would need to reorient our lives. Like, like Really? Um, I'm a sinner. I don't measure up to a holy God. I have a heart issue at my very core that, that my life is not my own and that, that, that I have a deep, deep issue that where I need some heart surgery. Like, that's, like, that's just kind of foreign to, to most. But yet, even for those who maybe have proclaimed a faith in Jesus... And they, they, they're part of the religious kind of, you know, trappings. I, I think for even many of us who declare a desire to follow Jesus, it's a challenge to understand really what true repentance actually looks like. This turning away and turning towards. Like, do I understand the need for repentance? And what keeps me from repenting? Um, when I think about this, I, I think there's a number of things that keep people from true repentance, from turning away and turning towards. I, I think for some, and this I think is really common, we play the comparison game, and we say things like, well, I'm not as bad as... Have you ever heard that if you were trying to have a conversation with somebody about salvation or maybe the the fact that uh, they needed a savior? Well, I'm not as bad as. And we compare ourselves, but we all do it. And we all have our little categories, right? Well, that's not going to cut it. For other people, uh, pride, just plain pride keeps us from repenting. And we would say things like, or we wouldn't say it, we would actually just kind of feel it inside. There is no possible way I can admit, fill in the blank. Like, what would people think of me? I just, I, there's no way I can do it. And so, so pride keeps us down. And and then in our, our day, another big one is just the, uh, the glorification of self, the autonomy of, of self. I am my God. My truth is is my truth. It is the truth, my truth. And so as long as we lift ourselves up and make ourselves the center of our our worlds and of our, our value system, we are going to struggle with genuine repentance, with this this turning away from the things that draw us away from God and and, and turn towards uh, Jesus. Now, in a couple of weeks' time, we're going to be looking at the Sermon on the Mount. And when Jesus was teaching his disciples on the hillside on the Sermon on the Mount, he actually started his teaching by saying that blessed or happy, 
That's another way to translate that word. Blessed or happy are those who are poor in spirit. What did he mean by that? Jesus was talking about people who know that on their own they are empty inside. They are completely, there's nothing there. They are not their own gods. Nothing is good enough for them to measure up to a holy God. Jesus says, blessed are those who actually find themselves at that point where they are empty inside and they mourn over it. They, 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 they long for somebody else to actually fill them up, to make them whole. And, and Jesus said, people like that, they will be filled. They will be comforted. And ultimately, they will be filled and they will be comforted through him. So he's kind of saying, ditch the comparison game. Rid yourself of all pride. When you come to the point of realizing that you're not your own God and you are at the end of yourself, allow God to meet you in your personal desert wilderness and begin a heart change in your life. And when you get to that point, it's going to manifest itself in a whole new life oriented on Jesus. And you know what? Some people would say, wow, that is such a simplistic, unsophisticated message. It is never going to work. Well, people came from all over Jerusalem, Judea, Jordan. People who were of high class, people who were of low class, people who were white collar, people who were blue collar. And they came to the most unlikely of places in the wilderness to hear this very, very basic message about turning. Turning away from and turning towards God. This unsophisticated message from somebody who lived this nomadic life and yet he was the voice preparing the way. And people responded. And people continue to respond today. We're going to hear it in the testimonies of those being baptized. We see it with new immigrants coming to our city who are being loved on by the Church of Prince George. We see it through the lives changed at Nest Lake Bible Camp. We see it in the lives of those who are walking alongside many of you in in consistent, long-term friendships. God uses a basic message of repentance to invite all people to reorient their lives onto His Son, Jesus Christ. And yet, not everyone believes... Not everybody wants to believe, and they don't want to believe for all kinds of reasons. There were some in that crowd in the Judean desert who were haters, just like any time or context, verse 7. But when he, that is John, saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to where he was baptizing, he said to them, you brood of vipers. This is a strong language, right? You're a bunch of dangerous snakes. Who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? Produce fruit in keeping with repentance. And don't think you can say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. I tell you that out of these stones, God can raise up children for Abraham. The axe is already at the root of the trees, and every tree that does not produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. I baptize you with water for repentance, but after me comes one who is more powerful than I, whose sandals I'm not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand. He will clear his threshing floor, gathering his wheat into the barn and burning up the chaff with unquenchable fire. Unfortunately, it was the religious leaders of the day who were avid haters of the message of repentance and reorientation. You see, the Pharisees, they had all the rules down and then they added some more. And they wanted to stick it to anybody who wasn't measuring up. But in doing so, they missed the entire point of having a heart of following God. The Sadducees, they were another group. They were even smaller than the Pharisees, but but they were wealthy elites. They didn't believe in the supernatural. They were religious leaders, though. And and they made life very miserable for the early church because they, they loved the state. They kind of were bound to the state. Both those groups, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, they hated each other. And here in the desert, they actually share some things in common as they investigate this wild man with a weird message, and boy, do they get an earful. Like, you guys are a bunch of dangerous snakes. 
You see, see, John is baptizing those who are repenting, remembering what repentance looks like. Those who are turning from sin, seeking a heart change, and they're wanting to bear fruit. John wasn't, he wasn't fooled by those who were paying lip service like the religious leaders. Oh, they said all the right things. They had the right family background. They had the right cultural origins. But their heart hadn't changed. Nothing inside had changed because they weren't truly repenting. They weren't reorienting their lives on Jesus. And John is adamant that unless they produced fruit demonstrating their allegiance to Jesus, all the externals, those are just just window dressing. And they better prepare themselves for a time when Jesus would come and would actually um, demonstrate judgment, a separation of those who are truly followers of Jesus and those who are not. Now, that, that is a really, really strong message. And it wasn't, it wasn't a message for people just two millennia ago in the Judean desert out in the middle of nowhere. It's, it's needed today. It's needed for you. It's needed for me. Here, here I am. I stand in front of you. I'm this religious leader. I'm one who is called to shepherd a church family. And I look, at, I look at this story and I ask myself, where's my heart? Is my life bearing the kind of fruit that demonstrates allegiance to Jesus? That demonstrates a reorientation around Jesus Christ? Do you ever ask these things? And for John, it was never about himself. He actually really didn't care what people thought about him. He was pretty much focused on on one thing. He was always pointing people to the one who was coming after him. It wasn't about him. John said, I'm the voice, but he's the word. Right? John chapter 1. The word became flesh. John said, I'm the messenger, but he's the message. John said, I baptize with water, but he's the one that will baptize with the Spirit and with fire, with judgment. And he's proclaiming this message and baptizing people as John's doing this. And guess who walks up? His second cousin, Jesus. Then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to be baptized by John. But John tried to deter him, saying, I need to be baptized by you. And and do you come to me? I would ask the same question. Jesus replied, let it be so. It's proper for us to do this to fulfill all righteousness. Then John consented. As soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water. And at that moment, heaven was opened, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, this is my Son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased." I I don't know about you, but I have wondered at points along the way um, why Jesus had to be baptized. (laughs) If he was the Son of God, sinless, the perfect person, like why in the world did Jesus need to be baptized? John was absolutely mystified. What's the deal? I know you. We were babies together. We grew up together. Like, I know what my friends were like, but you were never like them. Like, that could have been kind of part of the interaction that's going on for you, right? This isn't for you. You're, you're the sinless one. But Jesus' baptism was never, was never about whether he needed a savior or whether he needed to publicly declare his allegiance to his heavenly Father. There's probably several good really, you know, good theological reasons why Jesus was baptized. But the one that I think is most understandable to us is that when Jesus came into our world in the flesh, we celebrated that Christmas, he came to dwell with us, to live among us, to show us how to truly love God and to live for him. And while Jesus was sinless, perfect in every way, Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 15 declares that Jesus was also like us in every way. Hebrews says, for we do not have a high priest, he's speaking about Jesus, 
We do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. So imagine that. Jesus has struggled in every way, just like you, just like me, and yet he never, never wavered. He never stumbled. But in being tempted and challenged and struggled in every way, Jesus can identify with you in your challenges, in your trials, in your temptations, in your joys, also in your sorrows. So when, so when Jesus is standing in the water, to be baptized by John, here's the only person, the only sinless person who has ever lived, the one who embodies righteousness. Like, he is righteous. And he's standing with all of those who've come from their different ways of life. In the big city of Jerusalem, the rural folks in Judea, those people across the river in Jordan, all these folks with their different backgrounds, their different cultural struggles and issues, their joys, their sorrows, all those who needed Jesus and his righteousness to make them clean, just like those who are going to be baptized in the second service. And Jesus is standing with them and is baptized. And he's going under the water, imagery of his own death, burial, and resurrection, ultimately doing something for them that they could never do for themselves. Taking their sin upon himself, dying on a cross, so that all people, whoever they are, whatever their story, could now become his righteousness and experience eternal life centered on Jesus. And when Jesus went down in that water, something incredible happened as he emerged all those folks who were there coming from all different parts of the countryside into that wilderness, they, they bore witness to something amazing. Jesus, the Son of God, born of a virgin to bring salvation for their sin, is standing in the water. The voice of the Heavenly Father is booming from the heavens. This is my Son whom I love. With Him I'm well pleased. The Spirit of God descends in, in a visible form like a dove, a gentle dove. This is, this is amazing as the entire Godhead is present at Jesus' baptism. This is no ordinary baptism service that day. And, and I'm sure that there was a lot of excited chatter in the crowd of those who were repenting and reorienting. And I'm guessing there probably was also increased obstinance of, of those in the religious leader crowd who came to investigate. But one thing is certain. One thing is certain. When those who came to repent and to reorient their lives on the one who could save them that day, who could bring them his righteousness, they began a brand new life. A fresh start new beginnings, second chances, all of heaven opened up. Like what a day of rejoicing that was. And what a day of rejoicing it still can be for all those who choose to turn away from that which draws away from God and to pull towards him. When we think about this message, this story in Matthew chapter 3, how might you respond to what God is saying through his word. There's a few possibilities, I think, that I want to simply extend to us today. The first is one of repentance. I think one appropriate response is repentance. Simple message, unsophisticated, completely you know, unpopular in, in our day. A turning from all of those things that kind of want to pull us in and a turning towards Jesus. Do you need to repent of your sin? Do you need to reorient your life on Jesus? I think that is an appropriate response uh, for, for us today. And some of you might be hearing going, I, I need to do that. I, I've never done it, or I've been playing a game. I've been playing the comparison game, the pride game, the my own God game, 
and I need to turn my life on Jesus. That is one appropriate response. The second one is baptism. If, if I truly am reorienting my life on Jesus, then I am going to publicly declare my faith through confession of my sin and my reorientation, and I want to walk in the newness of life together with a community of faith and start to grow in my walk with Jesus Christ. That would be a totally appropriate response. A third possible response is, I need to know more. I, I don't understand everything, and that's okay, neither do I. But if you want to know more, email our office a note. Come see me. Email me. My uh, email is uh, on our website. Uh, email me, and let's start a conversation. Because I know one thing for sure. That is, God wants to give you the best life possible, and the best life possible is one that is centered on and oriented on his son, Jesus Christ. And so today we have the opportunity to hear some of those stories in the second service and baptize those folks, but um, for now, we want, to, uh, we want to worship and we want to respond through song. I invite you to stand, and um, I'm going to pray and lead us in prayer. And if you want to respond in one of these ways that I've suggested, I would encourage you to do so in the quietness of, of your heart. Lord Jesus, we thank you for what you have done for us. Again, we're just reminded of the incredible price that was paid so that we could have an abundant life. Help us not to squander that. Help us to actually receive it, to accept it, to embrace it for ourselves, and then to start living it. Thank you that you give new life to all those who truly turn from their sin and turn towards you. Lord, we invite your spirit to do a deep work within us individually, within our church family, indeed in our city, in our province, in our world. Lord, as we reorient our lives on you, um, this city is going to be changed. Our values are going to change. Um, the, the, the values of the kingdom of, of your son Jesus are going to reign supreme. And so may it start with, with us. May it start today. May it start this year. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Also invite the ushers up to collect this morning's offering while we sing. I have decided.
so much for joining us this morning and uh, we trust that God is uh, working your life and we encourage you to stay around and uh, enjoy the fellowship of one another. Thank you to those who joined us online and if you would like to stay and uh, witness the baptisms, uh, that'll be towards the uh, latter part of our service and the second service, but we trust that you will go in, in God's strength and his peace today. Have a wonderful week.